Sex trafficking is one of the largest systems in the world and continues to exist in the United States, even today. This week on The Whitney Reynolds Show, we'll hear first-hand accounts with sex trafficking and what we can do to stop it. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you, and the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live. I met this guy who, you know, was my supposed to be lover. He told me he was my lover. He loved me. He was my mama, my sister, my brother. But as time went on, he would beat me. He beat me when I didn't want to go out. He beat me when I didn't want to have sex with him. Instead of just getting beat, even though I got beat, but to get beat all the time, I just had to follow his rules. I had to do what he said. It was like I have he had no say so in my own life. I was degraded. You know, when I got in and out them cars with them guys, they call me whatever they want to call me. I have been raped, beaten. You know, he would even beat me if somebody pulled the gun on me and took the money. Like I supposed to fight off somebody with a gun. It was rough. It was really rough for me. You know, I was trapped in something that I wanted to get out, but I had no resource of how to get out. I went to the jail, the penitentiary, and I always wound up going back to him because there was nothing else for me to go back to him. He just don't know how it is to be in something that you want to get out so bad, but you don't have no help and you don't know where to go. Today on The Whitney Reynolds Show, we're looking at sex trafficking. The video you just saw is from a victim of this horrible crime. Today's show is all about protecting those faces. Even though this goes on all the time, so many people are unaware of it. So today, we'd like to look at this tough topic to learn more about forms it comes in and then what we can do to help its victims. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. Today with us, we have Commander Bill Lean, who works at the Cook County Sheriff's Department. Commander Lean and his team work tirelessly to catch criminals related to sex trafficking in Chicago, and is here to tell us more. Welcome to the show today. You are truly an expert when it comes to sex trafficking because you have been investigating this for quite some time. Our, our department's been involved in this for forever, and uh, due to new laws, we've been able to really take it up a notch to go after traffickers. So a quick question, where is the line between prostitution and sex trafficking? Well, the, the sex trafficking side is the exploitation side of it. It's somebody that's being prostituted and it's generally by some reason, whether it's force, fraud, coercion, fear of that person leaving them, guilt, there's a lot of different dynamics that are involved. So with trying to catch the sex traffickers, is there something that you go after or you look for whenever you're trying to track people down? Well, there's different investigative techniques. Um, sometimes things are sent to us, tips. Okay. Sometimes um, our victim side comes across, identifies a victim, and then says this person would like to speak with some law enforcement to try and bring some justice to the person that basically enslaved them. So sex trafficking does not necessarily mean you're going to be loaded up in some semi and moved across all different states. It can be happening literally in your backyard. Sure, that's the thing, and I think that's what people need to understand. Uh, most of my experiences with domestic sex trafficking, these are women, children, young men from our area. Um, they don't necessarily have to come across borders. It's happening right here, it could be your neighbors. And with that, they these is it pimps that get people under their wing and start enforcing this and that's when the sex trafficking takes place? Right. Okay, so these pimps, how do they find their victims? There's a lot of, a lot of variables. Uh, one is through social media, you know, they follow people on Facebook and other websites. 
um, who doesn't want to have a million friends, right? Is it something that they hone in on the people that are on Facebook? Because I know, like, for me, I, I tell a little bit about my story on Facebook. And they hone in on people, and they befriend them, they um, start getting to know them, and then all of a sudden it becomes this love relationship that's not really truly there. Right, and then I'm not in any way saying Facebook is the cause of it, but there are ways that folks that are trying to exploit others have avenues of making contact with people. So just on social media in general, they get to know your story, and then they get you under their wing as if they know you. Right, it's a whole grooming process, and they do know little things about you. And when somebody approaches you and says, hey, don't you go to this school? Don't you play this sport? I think I recognize you. The person's guard may be down and think, maybe I do know this person. And in case our viewers don't know what the grooming process means, that is basically where they're trying to um, convince you that they're your friend, that you're loved, and they switch that on you? Correct. Um, a lot of our victims tell similar stories that it started out as a love relationship, and then at some point it turned into, well, you know what, we need to make some money, we need this, we need that, what if you go do this one time? Wow. All the way to severe beatings if they don't do what they're told to do. So in case any of our viewers are watching right now and they feel like they could be a victim of this, you know, one of the lines that as I was looking into this show, the prostitution and the sex trafficking, and now that we establish that there's a very uh, little line and they actually over, you know, they cross over a lot. How do, because um, prostitution is illegal. And if I was a woman that was maybe in this situation, I'd be worried to come forward. How do you, how do you, um, what would you recommend? They, they go ahead and come forward and there's safe houses and that kind of stuff for them? There's a whole system set up now. Um, over the years, we've been able to adapt a lot of things. The laws have changed. Um, law enforcement, social service providers, the medical field, psychiatry, we all work together to help combat this. Um, and there's services out there. And you're not going to get arrested if you come as a victim. And, and that's one of the things. Everything is very victim-centered at this point. Wow. And one of our ideas is we can take a victim and help the victim. Even if we can't get the trafficker, it's still a victory because we assisted somebody in getting out of that. In your time, have you seen that the sex trafficking rate has lowered? Or is it still, it's maybe just being talked about more? Like, where are we at with it? I think there's more people involved these days due to technology and the mm. ease of running an operation. You can use a cell phone and run a whole operation. Wow. Okay, well, anything else you want to leave our viewers with on this subject? Um, just public awareness is a big part of it. And the belief that it couldn't be happening in your own neighborhood is a falsehood. Right. So I think people have to be diligent, keep an eye on their kids and each other. I like what you said about keeping an eye on your kids because the grooming process doesn't discriminate on age. They don't look for a certain gender. Right. It could really happen across the board. Right, and it's proven. Wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. It's now time for the viewer's voice where we take this week's topic to the streets. This week's question is, what do you know about sex trafficking? Um, not much. Like, I know what it is, but I don't know where it happens. Like, if it happens around Chicago, I really don't know. I know what it is, and I know that it happens. I'm not sure where or how often. Um, to be honest, I know what it is, but um, as someone from Turkey, I don't really know how much it happens in um, Chicago. I actually do not know how often it happens in Turkey either, but I would like to learn about it. Uh, sex trafficking happens all over the world. Uh, it seems to be a continual thing that's been happening for a long time. What's actually being done in the U.S., I'm not actually quite aware, all well aware of. So. Um, but I do know it happens here quite a bit. I thought we we're much better off than most of like European countries, Eastern European bloc countries. So um, it's something that doesn't need to be dealt with. I'm not very well aware of what's actually currently happening though. Next up we have Caleb Probst who works with the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation. Caleb studies the behaviors of men who have bought sex here in Chicago and try to better understand how to stop this issue. Caleb works with young men in high school in teaching them to fight against the sex trade industry and prevent them from being part of the problem. Caleb, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you're going into high schools and working with young men that don't really have the issue yet. Right, and so according to the, to the research that, uh, that you mentioned, we found that most men who will purchase sex are going to do so for the first time in their very early 20s. Mm. And so this led us uh, in, in 2009 to say, 
What if we were to talk to men before they reach that critical point and, and looked at some of the attitudes and beliefs that men who are purchasing have and see where, where are we in, in high school objectifying women in some way, um, you know, maybe viewing sex as some sort of like exchange mm -hmm. and, and not, you know, it's nowhere near purchasing sex through prostitution, but let's talk about some of those attitudes and, and, and shift them a little bit so that when they do hit their early 20s, uh, they're not becoming patrons of the sex trade. And also, hopefully, uh, learning how to develop healthy relationships uh, in the process. That is such a proactive approach. How are parents taking that, knowing that you're going into the high schools and talking about sex trade? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not a mom yet, but I would think that I'd be like, hmm, is that a little too early? Well, I think the... Uh, there's, there's sort of the two parts to it. Um, the trafficking has become this issue that, that people are, are very interested in learning more about. So on the one hand, uh, parents and schools have been very positive about talking about trafficking. Right. But then when, when we go in and we're like, we're talking about you know, the ways to, to stop men from becoming part of it, it's like, well, my, my kid's not, not buying sex. Well, of, of course your kid's not buying sex. Most <laughs> teenagers uh, are not, but let's look at all of the other ways in which uh, we're feeding into the demand, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, pornography, uh, strip clubs, you know, the language that we use, uh, which can be very colorful and I won't say on your show. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but, but once, so, th so, so there's a little sort of like, Ooh, but, but once, once they sort of see that this isn't just about hey, kids, don't buy sex, right? It's not a just say no approach. It's, it's much more holistic. It's talking about the way we think of masculinity, the mm -hmm. way we think of relationships, the way we think of sexuality. Uh, and then they can start to see, oh, I, I, my kid would never have done this in the first place, but also now my son knows, you know, how to date in a, in a healthier way. And, and so... Once they sort of accept us and get us in the door and see the program, uh, it's been overwhelmingly positive. So you go in and you talk to them kind of about the sex trade in the sense of, you know, a lot of men in their early 20s buy. And do you ask them why they think that is? Yeah. So, so the, the very first day, we don't even, I don't even talk about the sex trade. I talk about gender and I talk about masculinity and the different influences we have. Uh, upon that, and then and then we begin to go. Oh, this sort of creates this paradigm where, even though we think we live in a very egalitarian society, men do still have privileges and they do still have power. And how does this feed into all sorts of potentials for harm? And then gradually get more specific into the different areas of of the sex trade. So we'll then talk about you know pornography. A lot of men who buy sex. Uh, talk about wanting to reenact something they saw in porn mm. and that's why they're purchasing sex and prostitution because they don't want to do that with their wife because they find it degrading. Right. Uh, a lot of porn is of uh, people who have been trafficked and so every time you're clicking on that website, you know, you're, you're very subtly contributing to the demand for trafficking and, and then they start to see like, oh, I can you know, be part of this solution or I can continue to, on that periphery, kind of contribute to the perpetuation of the harm. That is such a good example because I bet a lot of people don't think of just like clicking a mouse or watching one little thing could actually be, you know, contributing to the problem. Real quick, with parents um, at home that have young kids or uh, maybe outside of Chicago that they, there might not be that kind of this kind of program for them mm -hmm. would you recommend them opening the conversation is there a research they can find online about this absolutely if, if you go to to case's website we have a a, a section of, of toolkits and resources free for everyone to download look at i think uh the conversation is never too early to start i mean yeah. obviously when you're talking to a five-year-old it's very different <laughs> than the way you talk to your 15 year old wait till they hit puberty well, sh well, right. to, to explicitly yeah. discuss yeah. Uh, prostitution, but I think, you know, we can talk, how do we demonstrate respect for each other even when we're five? How do we know when, uh, what consent looks like, right. what in, you know, in, yeah. in the way kids play, that you is. know, like, hey, I don't want to play tackle 
whatever right now. Like, right. that, Learning, that's a yeah. great time to say, hey, that child doesn't want you uh, touching him or her. You know, oh, so those conversations can start as early as a kid can, can talk. And I, I say, you know, engage them because you're never going to be able to control what they do on the Internet. You're not going to be able to control what they do in their dating life. So as long as you've had those conversations and keep that conversation going throughout all of their, their the time in their house, you know, then I think it's... That's the best way to, to go about it. What an amazing tool to find that online. I hope um, our viewers are able to find that and check it out. Thank you so much, Caleb, for coming on. Sure, absolutely. Pilar Dunning is the program director for Stop It, a Salvation Army program that works to support victims of sex trafficking. Pilar has worked to help victims of sex trafficking become both emotionally and financially secure after surviving their ordeal. Pilar, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. So Stop It is something so crucial because today we've been talking about sex trafficking mm -hmm. and in shows past we've seen people, actually victims come on, but today we want people at home in case they are going through this or know someone that is to actually pay attention and know what to do. Yeah. And what is it that you guys do to help people and help this situation? Sure, so we encounter people on a variety of different um, like in a variety of different circumstances. A lot of times the people that we're working with um, wouldn't identify as being a survivor of sex trafficking, right? So they might be in a relationship with a partner who is forcing them to do something they don't wanna do. And a lot of times what, that, what they're being forced to do is to participate in sex acts against their will. So that could be a intimate partner who is saying to them, you know, I need you to make some money for me and I want you to do this by selling your body to my friends. Or it could be a youth who is very much at risk for being homeless or who needs some support. And so that youth is out there trading sex for food, for money, or for a place to stay. Wow, that is so fascinating because you're right. When you're playing through those scenarios, it does seem like it could happen very easily if people are down kind of like to their last dollar, they don't know where else to turn. So what kind of tools are you giving teens, women, men who might be in this type of situation? What kind of tools are you giving them? So we provide a lot of emotional support, right? So making it, building a relationship with them, building what we would call rapport, building trust. Mm -hmm. So encountering people where they're at, we meet them where they're at, wherever that, wherever that is. Um, so if they are willing to talk with us about what they've been going through, we talk to them about it. If they just talk to us in the sense of they want, to, they want some services or support for their friend, then we talk to them about their friend. Um, and so it really just depends on what they're looking for. So for um, somebody who is looking to exit the life, to get out of the life of what, that's the term that we use. So if they're looking to get out of the life, we offer them whatever it is that they need. So if they need some food, if they need shelter, we try to work to provide that for them and then give them the option to stay out or to leave or to, to find a straight job or to go to school. Is there a lot of shame associated with this? Because I feel like that would be probably the hardest words to murmur is that I'm, you know, maybe someone that loves me has forced me to do this. Absolutely. It's very common for the, it's very similar to domestic violence in that there is a cycle of emotional abuse and manipulation that's happening at the same time where there is this love and this trusting relationship. So trying to separate those things is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and so helping that person understand that they have a right to make those choices is, is something that's very kind of at the, at the crux of what, what we're doing. One thing I feel that's different about this show today is that we're understanding that sex trafficking falls, like it's a big umbrella. And there's a lot of, I'm mm -hmm. sure people that might, some of the things you mentioned, they fall under and they didn't even realize that is considered sex trafficking. Sure, so for so long we have referred to it in our society, right, as prostitution or um, you know, it's really cool to use the term pimping or some of that language, but recognizing it for what it is, which is an exploitation, and knowing that there is no teenage prostitution at all in the state of Illinois anymore. So typically we've referred to youth as being teenage prostitutes. That term is not to be used anymore because a teen cannot legally consent to being prostituted, right? 
So we are working to really encompass it as an all-encompassing term that includes sex trafficking, which for us means that somebody is being victimized and somebody's profiting from that victimization. Wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And yeah. Stop It is just really out. Is it in all the different states or is it mainly? No. So we are based in uh, Cook County. So we have a service area that includes all of northern Illinois. Um, we're a small staff and we provide case management. We do a lot of training and educational awareness. And then we also have a really strong partnership with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. What's the Salvation Army across the United States doing about this problem? The Salvation Army has some anti-trafficking programs in different states and cities across the country. And then on a national level, there is an initiative against sex trafficking that the National Salvation Army um, leads. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's now time for our social sizzle, and today we have Chris Baker, a youth pastor and tattoo artist. Since 2011, when he started his ministry, Chris volunteers his time to help victims of sex trafficking and former gang members remove their tattoos for free. Thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. What an amazing, um, I mean, thing you're doing because tattoos are really something that is said to be permanently on someone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, uh, we started it in 2011. I grew up in Los Angeles and a lot of my friends were in gangs as a kid and the ones that were lucky enough to grow up out of that life uh, would say things like, I wish I could get rid of these old tattoos. It's just not who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, it clicked. I was just looking for a way to serve the community and you know, gang issue is such a huge thing here in Chicago. And we just figured we'll start removing and covering tattoos for people for free. And there are tattoos associated with sex trafficking. Absolutely. Yeah, about three years ago, I was in a meeting with Homeland Security, and uh, they asked if their gang unit could introduce their trafficking unit to me. And so what does is, what is drug trafficking have to do with removing tattoos? I had no idea about human trafficking. And they gave me an education that day about the facts and figures and showed me pictures of tattoos that are related to sex trafficking and asked if I'd be willing to open up the ministry to help the victims of trafficking. It's like, how could you say no? And so with the sex trafficking tattoos, is there anything that people can look out for? And like, so that way they can keep, you know, if they maybe saw them, they could say, do you need help? Yeah, we see a number of barcode tattoos, just like you would find on any product that you buy in the store. And that's exactly what it represents. <sighs> um, so we see a lot of these tattoos of barcodes on the hands, the neck, or even on the face. And it's not, a joke like a no. bar it's like a real like they're labeling that as almost like a product absolutely that's exactly what it is it's just a way to demean their their victim and control them further so wow that is i wasn't expecting that yeah and so i'm i could only imagine the men and women coming in that get to have those removed what is one of your favorite stories of that well, I mean, there's so many, uh, you know, anytime we do a trafficking tattoo removal, it's very emotional, um, both for them and honestly for me too. Um, because once they feel comfortable with us, my wife is there with us and usually a victim specialist, um, they're very open about telling us their stories and it's, it's the hardest thing you could ever hear. Um, I can't imagine what they've been through and, and the pain of what they've gone through, but the relief on their face when they see that they no longer have to be constantly visually reminded of what they went through is a huge relief for them and it's it's an awesome feeling for us. You get people come in very often? Yeah we do. We work with uh, the FBI, Homeland Security, Cook County, Chicago Police Department so um, we, we do usually one or two every week so wow. it's quite busy in addition to the gang work we do. And then with the people being in there when they get to open up and tell their story I bet the healing process just across the board getting the tattoo removed and then being able to talk about their situations just probably you can just see the relief in their face yeah definitely I mean you know when people ask me about my tattoos I enjoy those conversations because I like to explain what they mean when someone asks a trafficking victim what does that tattoo on your neck mean that's a horrible trigger for them and it takes mm -hmm. them back to that place so you know it's it it is it's just an awesome feeling all the way around it's a completely complete relief that you know that part you know while their entire recovery and rehabilitation process is so large and there's so many people that play a role in that, it's, it's really awesome and cool for us to be able to play a small piece of that by taking away something that's so significant in that constant visual reminder. 
So we have you on the social sizzle today, which means we usually talk a little bit about Facebook and Twitter. Yes. So you do, you post these pictures and people get to see them. I do, yeah. It's important. I think, you know, the general public is really just starting to, to learn about sex trafficking uh, and what it is and how, how big of a problem it is in our country. And I think it's important for people to see that. And, you know, we have a couple things in our shop that we do. Like we have a, a tree I painted on an eight foot by eight foot canvas. And every time we remove a sex trafficking tattoo, the victims go ahead and dip their hand in paint and place it up on the tree to portray the leaves of that tree. Mm -hmm. And we have people that come to visit the shop just to see that tree and feel the energy from it. And it's, it's powerful. I believe that. Yeah. So, and you share those on Twitter. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, where can people find you on those? Uh, Inc. 180 on Facebook, um, at Inc. 180 on Twitter, and at Inc. 180 Boss on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and continuing to do what you do. Thank you very much for having me. Well, today we learned that sex traffickers use violence and other forms of extortion to force women, men, children, yes, children, into engaging in commercial sex against their will. Our show today highlights that there are people and organizations that are supporting and educating sex trafficking victims. For more information on the show, or if you are a victim of sex trafficking, make sure to reach out to WhitneyReynolds.com. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you, and the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live.